Part two of rocks and weathering is looking at weathering. Since the like previous years, many years ago, maybe about 10, you might still find exam paper questions that ask questions about these um, factors and these types of weathering. So just know that they've been removed from the course so you don't actually need to be able to explain those in detail yourself. Okay, let's get started. There are three main types of weathering. The two main ones are chemical weathering, which is decomposition. So this is breaking things down atom by atom. Now, over here on the right, we have like a coffee cup. So if you imagine coffee granules then as being uh, something that's a hard substance, but by adding boiling water to it, you can create a liquid with it. And that's kind of what's happening with chemical weathering in a lot of cases, because you're taking something that's solid in rock and you're breaking it down so that it becomes weakened. And that's what's happening inside the rock. So decomposition. Mechanical weathering, also called physical weathering, is disintegration. This is the tearing apart and breaking of rocks through physically destroying them. So these can be external forces. A lot of it is temperature changes causing them to crack and to break into smaller rocks and smaller rocks and smaller rocks. Biological weathering then can be done by both plants and animals, and it may be considered chemical or physical, depending on what's happening. What we can see here in the image with the trees in Angkor Wat in Cambodia is that these roots are breaking through the rocky temples and it's starting to break apart the temples. So that would be considered a biological weathering that is physical. Mechanical weathering is often referred to as freeze-thaw action. What we see here is that the cracks in the rock, water is able to go into these cracks and then they freeze and they expand. So they can expand up to about 9%. This causes a force within the rock and causes the crack to open up even wider. When the water thaws out, maybe the next day, let's say if it froze overnight, it would then be able to penetrate deeper into the rock and then it would be able to accumulate even more water into the crack and then freeze again at night and then in the morning it would be able to thaw out where it would turn back into water. So this process can continue. This can also happen seasonally because you could have it happen during the winter and then in the spring it starts to warm up and we see the thawing happening. This is really common in the upper parts of mountains each morning when the sun hits the upper part of very cold mountains we can see this causing a thawing effect and for lots of pieces of rock to break off. Here we can see two types of rocks that will come off from freeze-thaw weathering. We can see these big scree slopes over here, which is primarily made up of lots of small sediments all together across a large area. And then Felsamir, which is broken up into bigger chunks here. So we can see the very distinctive rocks there coated with snow. Heating and cooling, also referred to as thermal fracture or fracturing or exfoliation often. What we're seeing is that we might see a big daytime, nighttime difference in temperature again. So exposed rock would then start to crack and expand out when it's heated up under very hot temperatures, like in a desert. And then at nighttime, when the temperature dips right down and changes becoming cooler, it can contract. These consistent contractions and expansions means that it's going to break off into smaller fragments. Then what happens is just naturally under gravity, these layers will peel off. And this is why it's known as exfoliation. So this can happen in a block disintegration due to thermal fracturing like this one here, we see quite a large rock then split in the middle into a current sprung. And then we see granular disintegration. So block disintegration in the desert, we can often see on the right here, we can see it as rocks broken down and they will eventually collapse and break down there under that heat and that change between daytime and nighttime. And when they have fallen down, they can continue to break down until they're at granular level, like this sand dune over here. Salt crystal growth then has two components. In order for this to work, we need sodium, and we often see it along places like coastlines. So the uh, sodium sulfide and sodium carbonate, then they will expand uh, when they are heated up between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. This puts pressures on the joint and then this continues to expand. So this requires areas with a lot of salt and high temperatures. Pressure release. Is 
Okay, guys, if you like, please subscribe and let me know if you have any questions and I'll be happy to answer them. I hope that helped. If you want to continue learning, the rest of the course is below in our link. Um, you can sign up and learn there through all these videos. There's over 10 hours of videos of the content. Um, and this teaches you everything about the case studies, the concepts in each section, and you can just take it at your own pace. Um, within each course, then you'll get a PDF printout, some short questions and a video. Thank you.